2 Corinthians, are you there? Listen to what it says here. Chapter 1, beginning with verse 8. For we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about our trouble in Asia Minor, how we were utterly weighed down. Now this is the Apostle Paul saying this now. Part of the apostolic team that were with him. This is what, listen, listen and watch very closely what comes from this man's heart. He says, we were utterly weighed down beyond our strength so that we, we despaired even of life itself. This was a man who was apostolic, who, who, who was moving in an, in an incredible amount of God, God Almighty, to look what this man walked and moved in, the revelation, the anointing on his life. Planning churches, seeing miracles, walking in that incredible authority as an apostle. And here he is saying, look, we were beaten down and weighed down. We were starting to be despaired in our very own lives. Indeed, he says, we felt within ourselves that we had received the sentence of death and were convinced, listen to that, and convinced was that faith talking there. They were convinced that they would die. But this happened, listen to this, so that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. And in verse 10, it says here, he rescued us. Everybody say rescue. He says here, he rescued us from so great a threat of death and will continue to rescue us. On him, we have set our hope and he will again rescue us from danger and draw us near while you joining and helping us by your prayers. Then thanks will be given by many persons on our behalf for the gracious gift of deliverance granted to us through the prayers of many believers. Again, Paul, writing this letter from a place of despair. And in this short couple verses of Scripture, Paul uses a key word here, and that is the word rescue. It's not faith Scriptures here. This is not joy Scriptures here. This is not peace Scriptures here. This is a cry of despair from, an, from a heart that's crying out to God to be rescued. The word rescue means to be restored. It means to take back. It means to recover. And I love this word. It means recompense. <laughs> recompense. Recompense means God takes, takes back what has been stolen from you. He chases down. He hunts down the enemy and takes what has been taken from you and gives it back to you. That's recompense. In one definition. Now, let me say this. Paul would have never used the word rescue in this text here had there not been an enemy out stealing. None of this would have been pinned had there not been, had he not faced a thief. Now we all know that there is a thief on the loose. <laughs> we we all know that he is after what you and I possess in God. Am I right? He is after our possessions. He's after our blessings. He, we know that there is a thief that is after your identity. He is out to steal anything and everything. He is, he is set out to remove illegally every trace of God in our lives. If he can steal your joy, he will. If he can steal your confession, he will. If he can steal your wisdom and knowledge, he will. If he can steal your peace, he will. If he can steal your health, he will. If he can steal your prosperity, he will. He will rob you of every single trace of God in your lives. Jesus warned us about this thief in John 10.10. 10. Called him for what he was, a thief. Going about to steal, kill, and destroy. Tell the person next to you, the devil is a thief. 
tell him again, he's a thief. And there is no good thing in him. He's a thief. And it don't take rocket scientists to understand that the moment you get saved, soon after, you discover that there is a thief that is roaming around your neighborhood. And you know, I'm early on, I mean, there's no timeline. The devil don't wait until you get settled in your salvation for 10, 15 years of comfort before he shows up. The moment you draw your first breath of salvation, he's after that thing. He's standing around like a vulture praying to get one shred of evidence away from you. Ultimately, that's probably his biggest ambition in this world is to remove the traces of God on the earth. It's easy not to believe in God if there's no trace of God. How do you know God exists unless you see something of God? You see what I'm saying? And that's why he is, he is the thief after the love, the faith, and the unity, and the, and the miracles. He's after the giftings and callings. People today are, are sitting in churches even, and their calling has been stolen from, and they didn't even know they had it. Or if they did, they don't even know how to get it back. And some of them are so, we've met people over the years where the enemy showed up and lied to the man of God, told him he was unworthy to preach. And that gifting and calling got taken from him, from the devil I'm talking about. God never took it from him. And, 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 and lived a life of discouragement and, and, and humiliation that was never even earned or necessary. All because he believed in the lie. All because the door got unlocked and left open for the devil to come in and deceive his mind. I remember when I was a little boy, my dad, my mom and dad bought me a, a real expensive baseball glove because that was baseball was my passion. And not knowing the importance, I left my baseball glove out in the backyard and it got stolen. And from the kid in the backyard, the, the other side of the street, the right behind us, he had my glove and wouldn't give it back. And you know, what my dad said to me, I never forgot this. He said, son, I didn't buy you and didn't spend all that money to buy that glove for the neighbor. I bought it for you. I thought about that this week. And I thought, God, that's just like you as a father. You don't set out to bless you by giving what is yours to someone else. If he makes the gesture of giving you something, it's for you. It certainly has never been in the heart of God to offer you a blessing and just toss it in the air so the devil can come and take it. Amen? Uh, tell the person, I'm about to take back some stuff. Now, how many of you know, how, how many of you got some stuff that you need to take back? <laughs> I'm praying that the Lord will begin revealing everything that has ever been taken from you. Amen. Amen. <laughs> But it's a horrible, I felt so bad as a little boy knowing that someone else was enjoying my glove. How many of you know it's a horrible feeling in the pit of your stomach when you know you have been robbed? Paul was speaking here in, first, in 2 Corinthians from a place of despair, knowing that the enemy was present, robbing them. He was afraid that his very own life was about to be taken from him. The opposition was so great that he writes, we were utterly weighed down beyond our strength, despaired to even life itself. The good news is, is that we know Paul bounced back because in the next chapter, guess what he writes to the Corinthians? Do not be ignorant of the devil's devices. So we know that he came into the revelation. He told the Corinthians, don't ever let the devil take advantage of you. <laughs> Amen. All right, now I'm gonna give you something real quick. We're gonna go through this over the next few minutes, I'm going to give you some keys hidden in a scripture on how to take back what the enemy has taken from you. Now, stay with me on this. Turn with me to the book of Proverbs chapter six. There are four keys in this one and a half scriptures that we're going to look at, and you're going to see how necessary these keys are in order to take back what the enemy has stolen. Proverbs chapter six, verse 30. When you're there, say amen. And it says, men do not despise a thief if he steals to satisfy himself when he is hungry. And in verse 31, it says, but if he be found, he shall restore sevenfold. 
and he shall give all the substance of his house. In those two verses of scripture, do you believe that there are four mysteries, four key words here that will help you and I to be anointed and empowered to take back what the enemy has stolen and not only get back what has been taken, but to also get seven times dividends on top of that. Are you ready? Number one key, are you ready for this? Is to despise him. Notice that there in verse 30, it says that despise not a thief if he is stealing because of hunger. We're talking about an enemy of our soul. One who is banished and kicked out of heaven. We're talking about one who God ha who has declared an enemy. We're talking about the enemy of God's creation here. We're not talking about a, a, a one who is, who is hungry and doesn't know what to do. We're not talking about that. We're talking about a vicious killer that absolutely hates that you have any association with God at all. Pretty clear, huh? The key number one is to despise him. We know that the scripture says that he is a thief. We are to never sympathize with the enemy of our souls. There are so many believers today that the enemy is ravaging. I mean, just literally plundering everything. Then they wonder why they always have nothing. And, and the sad thing is, is they've never learned to despise the enemy that's taken it. It's, 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 it's sad when, you, when your mind and your heart gets so passive that you just say, okay, well, whatever. There's always tomorrow. That gift may not be for tomorrow. It, it may have been just for today. You see what I'm saying? Truth is, in the church, we've lost our ability to despise the thief. The word despise, you know what the word despise means? It means to look down. It means to scorn. It means to look with contempt. But I love this one. It means, are you ready? It means to have righteous indignation against the enemy of God. Now, it's one thing to get up and say you hate the devil or you hate sickness or you hate the present. It's one thing to say that. It's another thing to have righteous indignation. It is, you know what righteous indignation means? It means to stand for what is right. It means to stand for what is just and to not be pushed over. But I believe it's time that the church really, really, truly rises up in righteous indignation. Because righteous indignation says, no, devil, I don't think so. Because the word of God says, the word of God says that I'm blessed and not cursed. So why are you trying to steal the blessings from me? The Bible says that we've been given hope. Then why devil do you think I'm going to listen to you when you come to try to bring chaos to steal the hope from me? Righteous indignation says, no devil, it's not going to happen. Righteous indignation gets right at the face of the devil. Righteous indignation will say, I'm not bowing down. And I will stay and push and push until you go down, until my feet are on your head. That's number one. Are you ready for the second key here? The scripture says, but if he be found. Key number two is to find him. <laughs> I'm going to bless you with a story that you probably have never seen before. What does it mean to find the enemy? There's a difference between discovering and uncovering. Am I right? There is a story in the book of Samuel. I love this. It's in 1 Samuel. Chapter 30. And if you've ever read this story, this is where the story of Ziklag. You remember that story? Here's something that's absolutely wonderful. The Amalekites invade the territory of where God's people were at, David's people his wives and family and all their, 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 their kin and, and their possessions and, and the nation. And here comes the Amalekites, and guess what they do? When David and the men are not there, they come in and they plundered the land. And they took their wives, they took their children, they took all the spoils and all the wealth and left them with nothing. The men get back to the camp and there's nobody there. David, it says in the scripture, that he took 600 men. And they sought out, it says that they actually, that he actually inquired of the Lord, of the Holy Spirit, to find, to locate where, where my family at? Where's, what happened here? Because they didn't know. So you know what he did? He takes 600 men 
and they set out to find their families and their wealth. And guess what happens? As they are journeying, they come across an Egyptian slave. And the Egyptian slave got left there in this place with no food and no water. David and 600 men are on the hunt looking for the enemy that took and plundered their people. And guess what, guess what happened? God answers his prayer and leads them to a slave. On their journey of trying to find the enemy, God leads them to an Egyptian slave that had been rejected. And you know what David does? He, he tells the Egyptian slave, he says, why are you here in the wilderness? Why are you out here? And before he says that, he feeds him, gives him drink. And when he was restored, guess what the Egyptian tells him? I was part of the Amalekite tribe. I got left here. They abandoned me. And he tells David, if you promise not to harm me, I will take you right to their camp. I want you to tell the person next to you, it's time to find the strong man in your life. On their, now get this. I hope you're getting it already. I hope you know where I'm going with this. Because on their road to find the enemy, God leads them right to a rejected person. I heard a pastor share a testimony one time. He said, for 14 years pastoring, the devil stole people from our church. And he said, we were constantly having people taken from us until we got the revelation that we needed to change the venue of our evangelism. So you know what they did? They went out to the rejected, to the addicted, to the hopeless, to the unsaved, to the lost, the hurting, the sick. And he said, when we did that, guess what happened? The very rejected led us right to the storehouse of the devil. And the poorest of the poor became the richest treasures of our church. David got led to an Egyptian slave that the devil had abandoned. Here, here's the thing. If you take a drug addict on the street, they don't belong, they've been abandoned even by the devil. The devil has no right to own anything. I hope you're getting this. Because that Egyptian slave was the very one that when they fed him and when they clothed him, when they took care of him, was the very one that led him to the heart of Satan's storehouse. Number three. Are you ready for this one? What's number one? What's number two? Number three is to catch him. To catch him means to apprehend him or to bind him. What's the first thing that a police officer does when he catches a thief? He handcuffs him. Why? Well, so he won't go steal anymore. But then the second reason is so that he'll be able to go before the judge, right? Matthew 12, 29 says, how can one enter in a strong man's house and plunder his good unless he first binds the strong man, then indeed he may plunder his house. To bind means to forbid. It means to prohibit. It means to stop the enemy from looting and plundering. I'm glad somebody agrees with me here. Now, can I give you number four? And I'm going to wrap this up. The fourth nugget, the fourth key here is to seize the sevenfold. The word sevenfold means complete payback with dividends. It means perfect compensation, perfect restitution, and perfect recompense. Turn with me to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Are you all alive today? <clears throat> Just making sure. We got a pulse. We got a heartbeat. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. When you're there, say amen. Then I, Paul, together... With Silas and Timothy, greet the church of the Thessalonian Christians in the name of God our Father and our Master Jesus Christ. Our God gives you everything you need and makes you everything you're to be. You need to know, friends, that thanking God over and over for you is not only a pleasure, but it's a must. We have to do it. Your faith is growing phenomenally. Your love for each other is developing wonderfully. 
why it's only right that we give thanks. We're so proud of you. You're so steady and determined in your faith despite all the hard times that have come down on you. We tell everyone we meet in the churches all about you. And this is what he says. All this trouble is a clear sign that God has decided to make you fit for the kingdom. You're suffering now, but justice is on the way. I love what Paul said here that justice is on the way. Recompense is on the way. Sevenfold restoration is on the way. Your dividend check is on the way. Everything that has been taken from you is on the way, plus dividends. And Paul, the interesting thing about this scripture here compared to the Paul that you, that you read in Corinthians is, is that now Paul became a man of the moments, the timings of God, the suddenlies of God. Many believers today struggle to know the moments, but you got to remember that justice comes in the moment. Recompense will come in the moment, in the timing of God. And there was something that, that either matured or materialized in Paul from the time that he penned Corinthians to the Thessalonians because now he wasn't, he wasn't having to encourage about, look, don't give any room for the enemy. Don't be ignorant in, in, of his devices. Be on guard. But now he's saying, take courage because I've been where you're at and I know that justice is on the way. I know that where you've been is not going to be where you're going. That there's a moment where God will come and he'll bring restitution. Now, some believers can, can just say, well, look, I lost it years ago. I don't want it back. I'll take it. I'll honor God and thank God for it on your behalf. You don't want the blessing? I'll take it for you. <laughs> Glory to God. That's why Paul said, look, church, be encouraged. Take heart because the God of payback is on the way. It's hard for believers to believe that God wants to bless them, let alone reach back in time and bring back everything that's been lost. But that's what he was saying. Paul saw a church that had suffered greatly at the hands of this thief. And he was saying, look, the God of recompense will come. And he'll destroy the destroyer. And he's carrying with him everything that that enemy had taken. How many of you know that the joy of justice <laughs> needs to be restored in the church? The joy of justice. Come on now. You know what recompense means? It means God laughs. Psalms 2.4 said he sits in the heavens and laughs. Recompense means to receive payback at the double portion rate. You know what another word for recompense? It means workers' compensation. The word recompense is the same word root derivative where we get compensation, workers' compensation. God's saying, look, you're working for me. You got hurt in the service of the Lord. And now I'm going to give you workers' compensation. I'm going to give you double for your trouble. How many of you right now have lost years due to bad relationships? How many of you right now have lost years due to stolen finances? How many of you in here right now have lost years due to stolen health? I'm here to say, give you one promise, one truth, that God is greater than our mistakes. And he is the master at fixing disaster. Exodus 3, verse 20. Are you there? Exodus 3. There is, there are moments where God will tell us it's time to seize. We know that scripture tells us that the kingdom suffers violence and the violent takes it or the violent seizes it by force. I remember hearing about a documented miracle that took place back in the late 50s about a young boy, four years old, that had been diagnosed with 26 different disorders. 26 that this one young four-year-old baby boy had to endure. And the story got documented in the press. It, got, it even got put on the Phil Donahue show years later. Here's what happened. It was a tent revival. And the mama took the boy... The doctors had already told her, look, you'll never, the boy's never going to live to make it one year, let alone four. And now the boy had lived four years with 26 known disorders. He was blind. He was deaf. His arms and elbows had grown inward instead of outward. 
He couldn't, I mean, he could barely move. He was, had a lot of internal disorders going on. The doctor said he should have known. He should have been stillborn. That's what the doctor said. It's, a, it's amazing. He even has a heartbeat. 26 known disorders. The mama grabs her boy. They go to a tent revival. She had 35, 40 bucks. That's all she had. It was a five-day campaign that she was going to be there for. Come down to the last night. All she had was $20. That was it. The rest of it got spent on eating and things like that, lodging or whatever. She goes up to the man of God at, at, the, at the beginning of, right before the, the last service started, and she said, will you pray for my boy tonight? And he was a song leader and told her, look, if, if, you don't, if he doesn't get prayer, come see me after service, and I'll even take you to the trailer so that the ministry team can pray for him. The preacher comes out on the platform, interrupts the worship service, and this is what he says. He says, I'm feeling led of the Lord to take a, a faith offering. That's all he said. And he said, we're going to take up a faith offering, and God is just going to stretch faith, and miracles are going to be real. That's all he said. This lady gets up and grabs her four-year-old boy and runs to the front with a $20 bill, knowing it was all that she had left. Drops it in the, in the bucket, and at the end of the service, she brings this baby boy up for prayer, and the man of God saw this condition. He also had his tongue that would hang out. Couldn't even control the tongue. It just hung out. He grabs this baby boy and begins to pray. The very first thing that, that this preacher that, that shared this testimony, that saw eyewitness account... All of a sudden, his arms that had been turned in start snapping. And he said for the first few seconds, it looked like he wouldn't even get healed. It was just like all this strange breaking was going on. And all of a sudden, it just turned and snapped. And finally, his arms were straightened out. And the next thing he, know, he, he sees, he sees this milky film just begin like he was crying milk. And God was healing his eyes. And he said he put his hand over his head and just held him. And rebuked the deaf and dumb spirit. And God opened up his ears. And he said over a course of a few minutes. When this happened. 3,000 people in the tent stood up. I mean it's one thing for one to get a miracle. But for one to get 26 miracles. And the lady was completely. I mean completely speechless. And it was such an amazing, now, li now listen right now. This is what took a five-day campaign to six months. The lady stands up at the front and 3,000 people wanted to see the evidence of the miracle. And you know what she did? She stood off to the side and 3,000 people got in a line and just walked by and just saw what God had did to this boy. And by this time, the preacher was sitting down, the boy was in his lap and he just holding the boy. Every time someone would go by the woman, you know what they did? They handed, now listen to this, in a folded, they handed her a folded up piece of paper, which she thought maybe was just an encouraging word. Fills up a thing that she had. End of the service, many of those 3,000 people were taking money, putting them in paper and giving them to that lady. Now listen to this. Seven dollars, uh, $20 she dropped just as a faith offering, God increased it sevenfold. And then she goes home with a four-year-old son completely healed. That story ended up on Phil Donahue back in, I think it was mid-70s. And they documented in the Christian community, it's documented as one of the greatest miracles of our time for one boy to receive 26 miracles. Here's the, here's the wonderful truth behind this. It's an easy, and it's in Exodus chapter 3, verse 20. And it says, And I will put my hand forth and smite Egypt with all my wonders, which I will do in the midst thereof. And after that, he will let you go. And I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And it shall come to pass that when you go, you shall not go empty. But every woman shall ask of her neighbor and of her sojourns in their house jewels of silver, jewels of gold and raiment, and you shall put them 
upon your sons and upon your daughters, and you shall despoil the Egyptians. You know what the word despoil means? It means the very first word that we quoted in Corinthians. It means to rescue. It means to snatch back. It means to recover. A sevenfold payback is our right as God's people because he promised it to us. That if the enemy has taken a $5 item, just using it as an example, that means that not only does he have to pay that back, but he has to increase the dividends by seven times. And I love the Proverbs take on it because he wrote, Solomon wrote in Proverbs, he said, look, if he don't have the seven times, if you catch that thief and he does not have the seven dividends in value, guess what he has to do? Has to give up his own property. <sighs> when was that? Last Tuesday, you gave that prophetic word about uh, Proverbs, this Proverbs. God was saying that everything that had been taken from this house, the devil don't have the dividends to pay back, but he does with the property. Tell the person next to you, I want my stuff back. Stand upon your feet with me.